Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and it's time once again for your weekly wrap up. Another Monday is here and we got a doozy today to talk about, which is Apple's new child safety measures where they will be inspecting photos on your phone to see if they contain child pornography. A lot to this story, so let's get to it. Now, this whole thing came out of nowhere last week. There was a couple of press reports, and then the following day, Apple released a statement on their website detailing exactly what they plan on doing. And a lot of the concerns that people had from those initial unconfirmed press reports kind of came true here, where Apple said, yes, we will be inspecting photos on phones and iPads before they get synchronized up with our iCloud service. We'll dive into how that feature works in a minute. But there's actually three components to what they're rolling out here. One, of course, is that photo inspection thing that is, I think, a big area of concern. But the other two areas are things that I think are actually helpful. One involves Messenger and the other involves Siri. Now, on the Messenger side, what's going to happen when this feature gets rolled out shortly is that if you have a family account set up with your iOS devices in the house, if an inappropriate image is sent to one of the children in the household, it is going to initially block viewing of a photo that it thinks might be inappropriate. And if the child decides to look at it, it's going to let them know that uh, you're, you might see something you shouldn't, and we're going to notify your parents either way, and we're going to send the picture that you're receiving to your parents as well. Now, unfortunately, this only works through Messenger. So if the kid is using Facebook Messenger or Google, whatever, uh, they're not going to be able to get this feature uh, implemented. Uh, they're also adding some features to Siri. And if you recall, way back in the early days of Siri, they added features to help people who might be considering suicide. If, you, if it felt like you were going in that direction, they would uh, suggest that you dial the suicide prevention hotline and would actually put the number up on screen so you could tap on it and make the call. And I think that has probably saved lives because Apple discovered a lot of people were telling Siri a lot of their inner thoughts and this was a way to prevent those sorts of things. And they're going to expand that notion uh, to people that might be searching for ways to harm children. So what'll happen here is somebody asks Siri, how do I report potential child abuse? Rather than just giving them a Google search, it's going to give them a button they can push to file a report directly. And I'm assuming that's going to go to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. The other feature here is that if somebody is asking for ways to find imagery they shouldn't be looking for, or perhaps commit some other harm to children, uh, they will get a message here about how they can get help and will be directed to hotlines and other places they can call to prevent them from harming a child. So these things, no problem. I'm okay with that. Now, the big controversy, though, is in regards to what Apple calls CSAM detection. Uh, that stands for Child Sexual Abuse Material. And what's going to happen here is that if you are syncing your iPad or iPhone with iCloud Photos, before the photo is sent to Apple, your phone will develop a digital fingerprint of every image that it's about to upload to iCloud. And before it sends that photo up, it is going to compare the picture that you just took or imported into your photo library with a database of known CSAM imagery. Now, you're not going to have a bunch of bad images downloaded to your phone, but the fingerprint of these bad images will be on your phone, the database, the numbers. And if your photo is a close enough match to one of these photos in the database, then a safety voucher is going to get sent to Apple. And if there is a threshold of matches exceeded, then what will happen after that is your photos will be decrypted and sent to Apple. Apple will review them, and if they determine that you do, in fact, have known CSAM on your phone or iCloud account, they will then send that to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and that, of course, will get turned over to law enforcement. Now, the big difference here between the CSAM detector and the messenger feature that we talked about earlier is that this is only looking for known imagery that is believed to be circulating throughout the world, and these are images that were fingerprinted by Apple and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And as such, Apple says that the chances of a false positive 
are one in a trillion. And as you saw earlier, it does take a certain number of images to reach the threshold in which those pictures get turned over to Apple. But there still is a ton of concern about this feature because your phone will effectively be treating you as somebody that is not to be trusted, right? It's saying that, hey, you know what? We're gonna make sure that your images are on the up and up before you send them to iCloud, just to be safe, right? And I think the concern here is that this technology can be used in areas that go beyond its initial purpose here, especially in countries where a government might be looking for people sharing certain pieces of information through their smartphones. And our phones have, of course, become very much a part of our personal privacy, almost as much as a file cabinet of our personal finance papers might have been a decade ago. And the question here is, why is Apple doing this? And I think the reason here is mostly due to PR, of course. Companies are not driven by doing the right thing. They're being driven by what is the best way to make more money. And for Apple, their marketing pitch to you, the customer, is that we are the privacy company. When you buy our product, we will keep your information safe, even from the government. And what's happening is the government wants access to these phones to stop people doing bad things. And that, of course, is a very difficult balancing act. And I do think that a majority of the public would probably say, well, you know what, if somebody's abusing kids, maybe they should have some way to get into the phone to build the evidence to put those people in jail. And I think Apple is doing this to say, hey, look, we're doing something about this and we're gonna keep your information safe. But I don't think this is gonna go far enough for the government. Now, what's been happening over the last couple of years is the US government has been trying to create a way for them to get a back door to every phone that is sold in this country. And of course, many other countries would love the opportunity to have backdoors into their citizens' phones as well. And here in the US, we have wiretapping laws. So for a telephone provider, they are required to allow the government to tap a line if there is a warrant to do so. And that was easy in the days when there was only one phone company, but now, of course, people communicate in a lot of different ways. So the law has been revised a lot lately to incorporate other things like voice over IP services. So for example, right now, your Skype calls can be tapped by the FBI. They have to provide that function to the government. Now the FBI has been trying to expand the law that allows for wiretapping to include all online communication software, more than just voice over IP services. And that of course has been the subject of a lot of debate over the last decade or so. It hasn't yet gone into effect but the FBI really wants this access. And right now they don't have it. And the communications that are being conducted on these platforms are encrypted and very difficult to get at unless they hack into a phone directly, for example. And there's a lot of legal ramifications of doing that activity, at least on American citizens. And Apple had their own dust up with the FBI back in 2016 when they refused to allow the FBI access to a phone that was in the possession of a terrorist in California. Uh, what Apple said was that we can't decrypt the phone because we don't have the decryption keys, only the customer does. And they also refused to take further steps to allow there to be a back door that the FBI could get access to. So what has the reaction been to all of this? Well, as you can imagine, privacy and security advocates are very concerned. The EFF put up a lengthy post the other day talking about all the things that people should be worried about here. Now, what's most interesting is that the feature that I was least concerned about is the one they have the most concern about, which is related to the iMessage features where it can detect inappropriate images being sent to a child. The EFF argues that while this is well-intentioned, it wouldn't be hard for Apple to change a few configuration flags to start looking for things other than inappropriate imagery. It could be looking for protest posters, perhaps, that are being shared among dissidents in a country that doesn't allow free speech and that kind of thing. So there are certainly some areas where this can be abused. And this debate was not helped by some comments made by a representative of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Uh, because in a memo to Apple that got leaked out to the press, she said that those concerned about privacy here are just screeching voices of the minority and that their voices will be louder. Certainly not a good way to open up a public discussion about a very big change to user privacy on the iPhone and iPad. So what are my predictions here? Well, one thing I can predict safely is that this is not gonna be good enough for any government around the world, including here in the US, 
They are going to continue to push for those cryptographic backdoors, and they're going to continue putting more pressure on Apple. And my concern about how they've rolled out these features is that this does allow for what they've started building here to be expanded to include things other than trying to keep kids safe. And that ultimately is my biggest fear. Now, one thing Apple has communicated out to the world is that, hey, we're gonna be looking at all your stuff on device. So if you're up to no good, maybe you shouldn't use our platforms. And I think that's where Apple is going with this, trying to get all of this stuff, whether it's bad things or freedom of speech, just off of their platforms completely so they don't have to deal with it. If they're communicating to users saying, hey, we can do X, Y, and Z with this data stored on your device, maybe you might be looking at another device or another service to use on your iPhone that won't be subject to local scanning. And I think that ultimately is what Apple is doing here. My chief concern though, is that the government will push Apple to take that local scanning feature, the CCM feature, beyond just known imagery and apply the algorithms that they've put into the messaging component. And what that will lead to is many more false alarms, many more private images of children that get sent to Apple. And we know Apple's track record in reviewing private data is not good. Uh, there was an article about a year or two ago uh, in Ireland about how Apple contractors were listening to a thousand Siri recordings every shift that they went to work trying to improve the recognition of the Siri speech system. But they were hearing a lot of private things when those recordings were sent over for them to review. And the more people you've got listening to private messages, the more things are going to leak out. There was another story from Belgium where a Google contractor doing similar work turned over recordings to a reporter who then went and interviewed people whose recordings got le leaked out uh, to the contractor. So they just cannot do this well. And that's my big concern is the scope of this feature creeping well beyond what it currently is. And I have no doubt the pressure on Apple now will be far worse than it was before, especially now that they've got some way to keep their stuff encrypted, but still look under the cryptographic protection. One thing that you should check out though, and I'm not endorsing this, but I think it's a good discussion to have, is an episode of Security Now from a little while back where Steve Gibson, who's one of my favorite podcasters, talks about some of the ways you could implement a cryptographic backdoor. And one of the ways that Steve suggested, again, not endorsing the concept, but just putting a concept out there, is that Apple could introduce multiple encryption keys per user store one of those keys securely, hopefully, uh, at Apple HQ and turn that key over to the government when a warrant was issued as kind of a compromise position between having the government getting free reign to everything, right? And Apple, I think, would be a company you could probably trust to keep those things secure. Again, I'm not endorsing it. It creates a whole bunch of other security issues because if those keys ever get out, everybody's phone is subject to being accessed. But it is an interesting discussion about how you might be able to approach this issue because at the end of the day, uh, there needs to be protection from bad people. And we have to figure out how we do that in the 21st century while still keeping everyone's private information private. And that's the real challenge here. I don't have an answer. I'm sure a lot of you have opinions as well. And I wanted to do this video today to just kind of look at exactly what Apple's proposing here, what it is, what it isn't. And then maybe we can have a discussion about how we might suggest ways to find this balance better than Apple, the government, and everyone else has been doing to date. Let me know what you thought down in the comments below. Now, this week's wrap up is being brought to you by all of you. I wanna thank Mark Dell and Eric's Variety Channel for contributing during one of our live streams via Super Chat the other day. I also wanna thank everyone who contributes on an ongoing basis and all of you who watch on a regular basis too because all of those things, of course, equal channel growth. And if you wanna to contribute to the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution. We also support the YouTube membership program and Floatplane along with Patreon. You can find me in a lot of other places including my Amazon page at lon.tv slash Amazon shop. The videos there are almost all of the videos that I upload here and they are all ad free. If you wanted to watch me without ads, if you don't have a YouTube premium subscription, that is a good option. And every video is uploaded up there in the order in which it's uploaded. So you can click and go through everything that I put up, not just what the algorithm has for you. 
We have some other ways to engage with the channel, including our newly put together Discord, which I do have to log into a little bit more frequently. Mark Dell and Brian Parker have been very helpful in getting that thing up and running. So definitely pop into the Discord if you can. We also have my very infrequent email list at lon.tv slash email. I usually email you when I've got something fun going on, like a live stream or whatever. So if you want to get notified every once in a while, definitely hit that up. We still, of course, have the Facebook group. And then we've got my store at lon.tv slash store, where I sell previously used items that we reviewed here on the channel. And if you want to be notified every time we add something to the store, you can go to lon.tv slash store alert and get an email every time we add something in there. And that is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. And I'll see you next time. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the lon.tv supporters, including gold level supporters, Chris Allegretta, Tom Albrecht, Jim Callagher, Hot Sauce and Video Games, and Brian Parker. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.